In a recent symposium organized by our Hong Kong Foundation and the Center for Health Systems and Policy Research, Professor Yo Eng Kiong, Professor of Public Health and Director of the Center for Health Systems and Policy Research at the JC School of Public Health and Primary Care of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, asserted that strategic purchasing must become an integral function of health system governance and be considered in the context of interconnected objectives at all health system levels. A panel of guest experts was invited to discuss the application of strategic purchasing in tackling key health system gaps for Hong Kong to fully achieve health for all. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege for me uh, to present this paper on behalf of our Hong Kong Foundation and our Center for Health Systems and Policy Research, which are set up by a generous donation from the Tung Foundation. Uh, it has enabled us to do uh, more policy studies uh, in partnership with the Foundation. I shall go through the background of this uh, report. This is really a follow-up from our previous study in 2008 on a fit-for-purpose health system. In that report, we talked about the need for a person-centered care and for a primary care-led integrated care. And in order for that to be done, you needed governance and governance levers, uh, particularly strategic purchasing. And today's uh, theme is really to go into greater depth of how strategic purchasing can enable us to have a, a system which will enable health for all and it's fit for purpose. The global challenges I think we are familiar is that in the Asian population, the rising prevalence of preventable chronic disease. So the key word is preventable. It generates demands for healthcare and there are viability and sustainability of doing more of the same. So our systems need to change and this is not unique to Hong Kong. So this is the global population. The deepest bars are individuals aged uh, over 65, and Hong Kong obviously has the same trends. And not only that, people are living longer, but not necessarily better. These are the percentage of population with chronic disease. So on the left side are the global figures. There are almost 50% of the population that have chronic disease. And on the right side is Hong Kong, uh, looking at the burden of chronic disease. The different bars are different age groups. So you can see that we have about half the population having chronic diseases. And not only that, we also have multimorbidity, people with more than one chronic disease. So this increases the complexity. The global figures on the left and on the right, 50% of individuals in Hong Kong uh, by the age they are 65 will have uh, more than one chronic disease. And as a result of that, you have functional disabilities. So people have stroke uh, disabilities, if not managed well. These are the ability to manage your uh, activities of daily living, eating, bathing yourself. So there are these problems of disability uh, resulting from poorly managed uh, chronic disease. And on the right side are uh, the figures from Hong Kong. So characteristics of chronic disease, which is important because the reason why we have a symposium today is about integrated care. It's a lifelong condition which is preventable. So it's lifelong and we need to manage it. The prevention, preventing first the onset of disease through lifestyle modification, that's primary prevention. Secondary, important, early detection and effective medical care to arrest progression of disease. Tertiary, continuous, and the word here is continuous, and comprehensive health care to prevent complications of disease, disability and death. Of course, and importantly, when people have these complications, rehabilitation and palliation to improve functioning and minimize suffering. First, this is our healthcare system. Complexity and technology changes. So we have specialization. Uh, and of course, with specialization as in industry, in management, you need to coordinate. So we have more people doing more specialized things, doing more on the same patient. So, and that requires coordination. And this is the issue about uh, integration. And we have individuals in different settings, primary, secondary, tertiary settings, and then we have uh, private and public uh, providers. And of course, at the bottom are the patients or the individuals that need care throughout the life course. So a global response to this, uh, to be fit for purpose, is to integrate health promotion, disease prevention, chronic disease management, palliation, and palliative care. It must be accessible, appropriate, and acceptable for 
patients and individuals, because they are key in terms of optimal outcomes. So it's no use for us to have a wonderful service in our hospitals and clinics if patients don't go there. If uh, patients do not trust uh, the system, if they're not participants in the process of care, because the, the uh, health outcomes are as much dependent on the patients uh, as on the system. And health and social care coordination and connectivity within and between primary and specialist hospital care. So people-centered health service sees patients as the participants as well as beneficiaries, respond to their needs and preferences in humane and holistic ways. And integrated health service are managed and delivered, ensure people receive the continuum of services at different levels and sites. So we have providing uh, care in, at different levels of care in different sites within the health system. Of course, this is not just Hong Kong doing it, just to sh demonstrate from our research that there are key drivers for uh, integrated care between countries. So these are just a few examples. So the top bar is the key driver is increasing burden of multiple chronic diseases. The benefits of people-centered integrated care is improved health and patient outcomes, enhances quality effectiveness, reduces demand, importantly, re minimizes duplication of service and care. And I'll sh show you some figures later in terms of the research we've done on some of our programs. Improves both technical and allocative efficiency of the system, enables cost reduction. This is just uh, the figures in Hong Kong we've seen before. Just look at the right side. The outpatient, when people do not have a chronic disease, the utilization of private sector is about 56%, public 24, and uh, dual utilization 11.7. But when you look at the second bar, when individuals have one chronic disease, they all migrate to the public sector. So 81% use public, uh, 59 continues to the private, but you see dual utilization, 44.7%. And then obviously we have the medical social divide. When we looked at the admissions to hospital, 15% were from residential care homes, 47% were preventable if, if there were good ability care services, and we have 20% uh, readmissions within 30 days. So this is because of lack of community care. So we had this conceptual uh, framework. On the left side is the hospital care, where the, the private and public are, are, are coordinated. And the right side with the district health centre uh, that the government is starting, they are the focal points to the connections to the community. And then connecting, uh, interfacing with the primary care service of the hospital authority, the private sector, and the service of the district health centre. So c coming back to today's topic, the investigation is how to strategically allocate healthcare resources. So purchasing is just a market term, but it's the same concept in terms of some, some concepts people use commissioning in the public sector. So you either make, which is commission, or you buy, which is your purchase from the market, to meet population demands. So it's really how you allocate resources to meet population demands uh, and meet systems, objectives, and goals for a primary care-led, person-centered, integrated care. So our study, the aim is to provide insights on best practices and lessons learned from international experience and in application of chronic disease prevention and management, identify challenges and gaps within our system, and how capacity in the private sector can be better leveraged through public-private partnerships, and assess the feasibility of a chronic disease screening voucher and management scheme. So this is specific work research that we did, and synthesize a conceptual system framework for strategic purchasing to meet system objectives and goals, which I think is a very key part of the study, uh, which uh, we hope will uh, help government in terms of enabling health for all. The research design and methods, we did a review of the literature and looked at institutional documents. We did a stakeholder analysis and generated insights from them. We did a population-based survey on acceptance for the screening, the economic analysis of the impact for the program that we're recommending, and then the synthesis of the findings. Strategic purchasing is one of the three functions of health uh, financing. Obviously, it's about revenue raising, pooling of funds, and purchasing. It's seen to be a financing strategy that seeks to align funding and financial initiatives with the services for the population needs and determine by detailed information on the performance of providers. When you look at that, strategic purchasing is a critical lever for allocating resources based on health needs of the population 
defined by the health system objectives and goals, and determined by the scope and quality of services and the performance of providers. The goals align with the objectives of universal health coverage and to maximize health outcomes, equity in financing, and financial protection. So the question first is to determine uh, the service that you require, and then to decide whether you make or buy, right? whether you commission or you purchase. And obviously, the decisions must be based on uh, assessment of the private sector and the public sector, and to see how best uh, those services can be provided. Obviously, you can purchase from both, because in social health insurance systems, you purchase from both public and private, uh, irrespective. So the similar concept could be used in Hong Kong as well. And importantly is who should be doing the purchasing. You need to identify the appropriate purchaser with capacity and to define the roles and parameters. So if government is not doing the purchasing, then you, you delegate it to an agency like the hospital authority. So that would be a purchaser. But government itself could be the overall uh, resource allocator. So it's a question of how best to do it. Then for whom to purchase? So I'll cover that later in terms of the parameters. It needs to be needs-based and the target population that would benefit. What to purchase, assessment of the service gaps and defined by service goals. From whom to purchase, just like providers based on capacity, availability, quality and appropriateness to requirements. How to purchase, quite important. Decide whether you should do it, use the demand or supply side instruments, which I'll cover later. The contractual terms, provider payments and incentive mechanisms, monitoring and accountability systems. So these are some of the elements of street purchasing, population health, cost-effective contracting, citizen empowerment, strengthening stewardship and capacity, developing effective purchaser and provider organizations. So these are some of the examples of strategic purchasing for chronic disease screening and management. So you can see that, in fact, all countries, in respect of the different types of health systems, tax-based, social health insurance, market-based, and mixed systems, all have programs to look at purchasing for chronic disease screening and management. We then reviewed the government policies to engage the private sector, the PPPs, and the three main policies implemented, uh, PPPs from the private sector, regulation of private homes, and introduction of uh, voluntary uh, health insurance schemes. So we looked at the different purchases for different programs uh, and then uh, assessed them. When we look at the financing uh, mechanisms, there are two main financing mechanisms. One is so-called supply side and the other is the demand side. The supply side looks at uh, giving resources to the provider. It motivates change in health providers to improve individual access. The beneficiary is the provider. The tools are incentive and payment guaranteed providers, such as capitation payments, fee-for-service, performance-based payment, and uh, referral vouchers. And for our systems in Hong Kong, our general outpatient uh, clinic and the PPPs uh, done by the uh, HA are supply-side instruments. The demand side stimulates individuals, uh, particularly underserved people, to demand for health service to increase utilization and access to underutilized services. So the beneficiary is a patient, and it's through financial subsidies and incentives such as vouchers and cash transfers. So our elderly health voucher and uh, uh, some of the other programs of vaccination are examples of the demand side instruments. Evaluating Hong Kong's uh, efforts in PPP, uh, when we look at some of the supply side prohibitors and demand side prohibitors and looked at the system prohibitors, uh, one of the key things we found was lack of integration between primary and specialty care, between public and private. So we have isolated programs, but the connections and linkages uh, are not there. There's uh, sometimes inadequate provider incentives and inadequate subsidies for patients for certain programs. And then one of the things was uh, the complaint was about demanding administrative procedures. I wanted to cover this, uh, in fact, I've covered it before, uh, to really demonstrate the, the need for strategic purchasing. This is the elderly voucher that has been launched in government. And maybe, as you know, that we're spending about $3 billion each year for the elderly voucher. This is based on studies that we did. In look at, at the voucher claims from Western medical conditions. So you can see the proportion in pink are the ones for management of acute conditions. The ones in blue are for chronic conditions. And the top one are the preventive. So in fact, there's very little money which is being spent on prevention and from chronic disease, so it's mainly acute. 
more importantly, when you look at uh, whether they usually consult public or private doctors, before using the voucher, you can see that 73% use the public as you expect for chronic disease, and 22% uh, use private only, right? and 49% uh, use uh, uh, both public and private. But when, after using the voucher, the number of people that kept on just public or private decreased. So 17% for public and 19% for private. And what happened is that 61% then utilized both public and private. So what you've done is to generate greater demand from the private sector, but has not decreased the demand on the public sector. And these are figures that we had looking at the voucher users and non-users. The voucher users are in blue and the non-voucher users are in red. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference in their utilization of our public outpatients, whether they were voucher users or not. And this is uh, data uh, also about voucher users. When you look at the um, general outpatient clinics, or over time, the number of voucher users that use outpatients have not changed. What has happened is that well, the people that use the private sector has changed. So voucher is a consumer-led demand-side financing tool. So it's like our uh, consumption voucher. It encourages consumption. It's more effective if it's targeted at a specific group for a specific health service that is uh, well-defined and time-limited and part of social services which are underutilized. One of the problems with the voucher design is that it's not well-defined. So patients don't know what primary care is, so they have a whole range of things. So they're, they're going in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, primary care, uh, and it's not helping the system. So it's very good for the consumer, right? So they have a choice in terms of what they want. But it doesn't do anything in terms of efficiency of the system. It just drives up consumption, and then uh, also it has some impact on uh, driving up costs. Because the individuals that use the voucher uh, do not have to pay for it. So this is just the summary of the uh, purchasing of primary care in Hong Kong. You can see the amount has increased dramatically. So we've looked at the programs, the family medicine specialists, the outpatient clinics. Uh, it has gradually increased, uh, but we then also have um, the voucher use in the bottom, elder health voucher, vaccine programs. So those have all increased dramatically. So the amount of money we've put into primary care for development has increased substantially. So we then look at a study in blind strategic purchase in chronic disease screening and management. So we use this as an example of how strategic purchasing can be more targeted uh, for screening and management. So we applied it to look for health system goals, uh, two principles, chronic disease screening voucher, and then a disease management scheme. So methodology is from key stakeholders, population survey and economic analysis. Who to purchase the government, for whom adults between 45 to 54, what to purchase and from whom. We propose a screening for high lipids, lipid screening, chronic disease management, uh, diabetes and hypertension, and follow up with uh, family doctors. How to purchase would be a hybrid model. The demand side instrument would to fully subsidize the voucher because you really then it's targeted. But we need a supply side instrument, which is performance based, uh, to offer providers to manage services, which finances flexibility and for co payments to be uh, determined. So it's a mix using two instruments. When we did the population survey, 75% of respondents without a prior diagnosis we expect willingness to participate. Physical accessibility was reported to be important and convenience of location. Financial affordability was a factor in the decision for regular screening and 58% attributed reasonable service pricing at prime or second consideration. Uh, and insufficient, or sufficiently, insufficient of, in affordability uh, and without insurance were likely uh, to use the public sector for screening and management. But individuals were also willing to pay. So we asked them whether they were willing to pay for chronic disease. And you can see that it's quite a number of people, in fact 75% of respondents willing to pay for chronic disease conditions ranging from 51 to 500. So in the middle bar would be uh, people willing to pay 100 to 200, 31.5%. So we also did this an economic analysis looking at the different progression of disease in terms of progression rate. So these assumptions are going to the detail for time. And we looked at two scenarios, scenario one and two. Scenario two really was uh, looking at the costs associated with the 
program in the hospital authority, the, the risk assessment management program for chronic disease, and on the scenario one is the standard outpatient costs. So just to summarize, what we found that there were cost savings over 30 years for scenario one, which is the general outpatient costs of, uh, of 31 billion, and then scenario two would be more expensive because of the spe more specialized. Of course, we also had a decrease in mortality for diabetes and pre-diabetes in the two scenarios. And the total prevented mortality was 28,700 for scenario one, 47,000 for scenario two. And the cost to prevent one death was over a million for scenario one and 696,000 for scenario two. So finally, I just want to go on to the recommendations. Uh, we should apply strategic purchasing and leverage public-private partnerships as a purchasing instrument with a strategic vision to improve primary care accessibility in Hong Kong. So these are the steps of what serves to purchase, whether to provide or, or purchase, for whom, from whom, who, are, who to purchase, and how to purchase. So we also thought that Hong Kong should consider introducing the chronic disease screening voucher and management program to enhance uh, primary care accessibility. So one age group that we would investigate was 45 to 54, but it could also apply to the elderly health voucher. So that could be the start of using the healthy health voucher to construct a screening and management program. Uh, and these are the components uh, when government is considering strategic purchasing, looking at components to be considered population health, citizens' empowerment, strengthening government stewardship and capacity, developing effective purchaser provider organizations, and incorporate cost-effective contracting. And finally, I just want to cover this, which is uh, the key part of uh, how strategic purchasing can be implemented for achieving an integrated care system to enable health for all. So in this systems level of strategic purchasing, there are three levels of the health system. The first is the so-called governance or the policy level, which is the macro. The second would be the purchaser provider systems, the major level. And then the third, importantly, the actual delivery at the person, personal January. So when we look at the macro level, there are four key functions that need to be looked at. One is governance. Second, the policy parameters for providers. Third, collaboration. Four, oversight. So it needs to be informed by policy needs assessment in conjunction with evaluation of delivery system. So to look at where the gaps are in the delivery system as part of the governance and deciding the policy instruments to enable implementation. And if one decides that the purchaser uh, is not the government, then policy parameters have to be set for the purchaser uh, uh, in terms of the contracting commission, the policy guidance, authorization uh, for the purchasers to purchase services, and the objectives and goals. And of course, importantly, there needs a system of oversight and, and accountability, looking at licensing and, account and uh, accreditation, monitoring, evaluation, uh, reviewing, uh, and auditing. At the major level, the purchasing commission and provider systems needs to be looked at the roles and authority and obligations of the purchases, uh, the engagement with governments to align functions, uh, structures for communication and collaboration with the stakeholders, uh, and uh, looking at uh, how services should be integrated, the mixed type settings and providers of care, networking of services and agreements for resource deployment and bridging mechanisms uh, and looking at the uh, systems for coordination which would be facilitated by care paths, clinical protocols and multidisciplinary team engagement. Of course, importantly, is how to monitor results, process reviews, performance monitoring and uh, patient feedback. Of course, at the person level, we would be enable the individual to have a seamless journey in care delivery across preventive, curative, rehabilitative, palliative, and social care. It needs to be considered bridging and coordinating mechanisms to be considered in the purchasing process to enable so-called vertical integration of care and horizontal between specialities, between social and medical care, and transitions to and from the community. So finally, strategic purchasing enabling health for all. For our system to be fit for purpose for the 21st century, a strategic goal for transformation to primary care-led integrated person-centered care health system is critical. Strategic purchasing is a critical lever to enable resources to be effectively allocated to meet system goals and population needs should be incorporated in health system governance functions, enable better resource utilization, fostering closer integration and healthcare development of primary, secondary and tertiary care and coordination with social care. Thank you.
Thanks to everybody for coming. And also, we have a delightful session with our esteemed panelists. Uh, maybe I first uh, ask uh, each of our panelists, uh, Tim, Henry, uh, Donald first, uh, to give us a couple minutes of, sort of remark and response uh, or thoughts of our report recommendations. And, and, and particularly, what do you think uh, the strategic purchasing why is that important, or do you think it's important in sort of propelling the health system transformation in Hong Kong? So uh, may I ask uh, maybe this way, Donald? <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, I congratulate the Foundation for an excellent report, very comprehensive, and really looking at some of the gaps or, or health, health provision inefficiencies. I think um, it's all agreed that primary care is very important to alleviate the stress on our healthcare system. But we look at four aspects, which I think the report covers. The essence of primary care, number one is, of course, the end user. Uh, Health-seeking behavior, hazards. And I think this has been well covered in your report. Uh, for example, to target high-risk groups. Uh, but I think quite important is also to change the health-seeking behavior uh, through education and all that, so that they still do not flock to hospitals for primary care and all that. But still, that has to do with the other factors as I talk about. The second is the provider, basically delivering primary care. And it has mentioned a lot about family doctors, which is wonderful, but primary care is also a team approach led by family doctors. I think patients still want to see a doctor, and but to have the support of the team of the ancillary care and all that, would be the way to uh, move people, shift back to the community. And I think that has been also um, mentioned. But also the provider-wise, I think it's quite important to uh, establish trust by the end users so that they feel comfortable in seeing the so-called family doctors that they're providing safe and high quality service and all that. The third thing is the financing, of course, which is very well covered, which I think strategic purchasing is really very good. I've always been questioning the problem of pr uh, provider purchases split, the provider being the same one as the purchaser. And I think this has been addressed, especially I'm really happy to see the use of private resources to purchase from the private sector as such. So I think that is well covered as well. But lastly, most important is also the stewardship, which has been mentioned as well in the report. How to administer all this? who holds the funds, how to ensure service is delivered. So again, with the primary care forthcoming report and all that, hopefully this can be addressed as well. Henry? I too would echo what Donald said in terms of uh, offering my congratulations to both the foundation and particularly Professor Yo for an excellent report. Now, speaking personally, I agree with all the four recommendations in this report, uh, following on with the 2018 report. However, I do think that going forward, we would have to address two issues in order to implement the recommendations in the report. The first one is manpower. I think government would have to supplement or the foundation will have to supplement this report with a manpower policy. Because what the recommendation means is in the long run, it would alleviate our medical health system for sure with primary care. But in the interim, what we're suggesting is in fact to be more preventive and therefore to have more patients utilizing the medical services in Hong Kong. I mean, it can be in the private sector or it can be in the public sector, but more people will be using medical services. Therefore, there will be more constraint on the lack of medical professionals, which we are already facing today. We would have to supplement this report with a medical manpower policy for Hong Kong as we move forward. In the long run, it will save us money, as the report said, but in the short run, we need to resolve a lot of problems. So this is my first point. The second point, uh, which uh, Dono also touched upon, is of course the question of money. How are we going to finance all of this? 
Now, the chief executive has already said that uh, during her reign, she has increased hospital authorities' funding by 45% between 2017 and 2021. Now, with these recommendations, more funds will be needed. Even if we ask people to co-pay, there would still be financing requirements. So we will have to resolve the financing issues before we decide to proceed. How is Hong Kong going to finance these additional initiatives? I have no ready answer, but there are ways to look at it. Uh, Co-payment is one way. I recall many years ago when I was sitting on an advisory committee for Dr. Yok Chow to look at medical insurance. We came up with a recommendation that there should be mandatory compulsory medical insurance for everybody in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, that recommendation, for political reasons, was eventually not adopted. And what we have today is a voluntary medical insurance scheme. Mm. Is it time now for us to revisit this issue? These are some of the thoughts that came to my mind as I listened to mm. the, uh, uh, the introduction of this report. But I think two issues, in short, manpower and financing. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. I will just give, give Professor your heads up. I will pass the mic to you after Tim. Okay.嗯，唔好介意我用广东话去诶回应，因为诶我想即系比较贴地啲同埋传神啲去分享下我哋喺前线接触好多基层市民同埋长期白患者嘅时候咧，佢哋嗰个经历。咁我谂诶有
back to Professor Yo about the two points from Henry on manpower and also financing. So I think Henry, you also agree that in the long run, we're going to save money um, by doing this. But what you're saying is, in the short term, inevitably, it will incur a bit more expenses uh, uh, first to actually reap the reward afterwards. Is, 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 exactly. is it fair to and, cap? And uh, we must bear in mind that there can be no long term without short term. So we've got to resolve the short term issue as well as the long term together. Okay. Uh, Professor Yeo? Okay. I just want to point out that uh, we, we did this summary, but uh, obviously I didn't highlight the figures. From 2017 to 18, the total public expenditure of primary care was $8.9 By 2021, by a calculation, obviously uh, we just based on public figures, some is not exactly mm. primary care, it's $22.8 So we had more than double, it's almost treble the amount of money. But is it money well spent? I think the chief executive itself talked about the district health system. And the elderly voucher, I think Tim has already mentioned, it's done nothing for the system. So if we had a better strategic purchasing system, this sort of problems would not arise because you would have dealt with the problem. So going forward, I think government should really seriously consider looking at those parameters and developing capacity. And importantly, what government has not recognised is the need for integrated care. So in the uh, government's webpage, they talk about two strategic objectives, primary care and the purchasing from the private sector. But what's missing is integrative care, which is important because if you do not do that, you're going to duplicate care and there are going to be gaps. So it's gaps in, in uh, duplication of, of care, duplication of services. Uh, so that needs to be factored in as a key part of the system. And the point about... Uh, Mr. Fang talked about the uh, resources and the manpower. Uh, we, when we did this study, uh, there's not a problem with the screening, because screening is quite easy to do. If government wants to, to do the uh, chronic disease management, our, our studies are really just an example. We need to do much more work to look at different scenarios, because many people already have, have, are under treatment. There are a certain number, uh, probably 20 or 30 percent, that may be um, unknown. Uh, and they, but they're going to turn the system. So up front, you're, you're right that you have an additional number of people. And then looking at capacity in the private sector, I'm sure that's a capacity. You don't need to do, do it in the public sector. So you, you pick up diseases earlier. And primary care, as Donald was saying, is not just about doctors. It's a primary care team. So what's Singapore? Singapore, in fact, has a screening program and a chronic disease program. And the government, uh, government funds uh, for people below the um, medium household income. So the others uh, 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 do it all the same. So government then provides those resources for, for people below the um, medium income. And what they've done is they contract with groups of doctors, right? So, so they, they're forming networks. Uh, so they, they recognize for chronic disease management cannot be done by a single, uh, Don was saying, by a single person. It, you need primary care development needs to look at groups of doctors, right, in, in future. Uh, that could provide multidisciplinary care. So Singapore has actually, what they've done, they contract with and they encourage doctors to form networks and they help them build, develop the capacity. And in fact, when, when I was uh, in the, in, in the with secretary, one of the reasons why we said we want to transfer the hospitals to the uh, HA was to integrate care. But also at that time, my concept was that one, one third of the facilities could be used for training family doctors to provide services, and you can then help them develop the systems as a training for these. They can be then private providers. HA can send, let out the premises to them, so they can then start groups of doctors. As you're right, you need to train people. You need to form that, that uh, network. So what we're doing is that we just put it on the cards, but we are not suggesting that this is something that's going to be easily done, but it needs to be considered. Because it's a question of then if government has some money in the future, when resources are better, it's something you can consider. Maybe not now, and you can build up the time, do the more research, looking at the feasibility. Uh, so you need more research in, in that area. So it's, it's not something that we know that we just produce that just based on some published surveys and, and uh, budget analysis, but in, uh, much more work needs to be done. Maybe Donald can talk about the uh, capacity issue as well. The, the two things, actually, I'd like to add some comments, which are linked to actually manpower and finance. Manpower, actually, um, family doctors are trained 
continuity is an important thing, so in chronic disease management, in screening and all that, it's part of the job. It's a matter of whether they want to do it. Is, is there enough incentive for them to do it? So there's something else you have to look at from the finance point of view. But also, I think the sense of responsibility for one's health is also very important. And that is linked to financing. That's why I agree that we may want to explore sort of mandatory medical insurance, or even actually at a point I was involved in a study on man mandatory savings plan, like the one in Singapore, which can be passed on to second generation and all that. But all this will, I think, um, help change patients' health-seeking behavior so that they don't rely on government. And that's why this report is so good. The strategic purchasing is targeting our needs and also to make use of all the resources. Uh, Donald, can you elaborate a bit more on the incentive that, uh, that can sort of mobilize the private yes. doctors? Uh, well, to first do a of bit all, more? in the old days, untrained specialists were GPs, so they were looked upon as sort of the, the, the lower grade service provider. So, number one, I think a recognition of their status as a specialist is an in incentive so that patients and the public realize that these are trained sort of primary care doctors in family medicine, and they can provide. So that's one re incentive, is the recognition. Mm. And the second, of course, is the financial incentive. Right now, it's very difficult in a way in the PPP programs and all that. I think partially because of the expense of drugs and, and mm. pharmacy. Consultation fees, I think, are, are limited, and doctors are quite happy with a proper recognition. But programs that need to ask them to include medication would be quite difficult. And hence, you know, we see some light in the district health centers. Mm -hmm. If we can start seeing how they can truly support to provide holistic care by the family doctor and also re-explore the concept of community pharmacies to separate the, the prescription so that the expense of the medication can be borne partially, for example, by government. Can I ask you a sensitive question? Um, from a private doctor perspective, do you think the HA doctors are quite collaborative in the PPP programs? I think definite improvement over the years. And that's why I talk about recognition. I think the specialists, the hospital-based doctors, now realize the role of the primary care doctors. So I think uh, the mutual respect is a lot. And this is most important. Before, I think, say, 20 years ago, hospital-based doctors were reluctant to, to provide any information you know, after admission. You know, they think this is the GP that threw the case in and all that. But now, with the e-health record, with better communication and understanding of family medicine, I think things have improved. Professor Yo, is there anything we can do to help XA doctors to be more, even more collaborative uh, with the PBP programs? I, I think it's, it's both uh, the uh, management systems. It's really the understanding and the engagement and people understanding what the objective is and how it helps them. I, I don't see that the docs in Asia are necessarily uh, not collaborative. I think they're obviously because they, 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 they're different doctors in different programs, and some of them really do not involve in it. But I'm sure they, they, they appreciate the, the value of the collaboration. So maybe it's just some of the communication problems. It's about implementation uh, and the design. And many programs, because it's also what the uh, Bureau is now very keen about, implementation science. Implementation science, the pro problem is that when you have a good program, the program is, does fa that fails for two reasons. One, it's not based on uh, good uh, designs and, and evidence. The second is implemented poorly. Uh, and of course, implementation is very important in terms of developing the so-called implementation strategy, mm. engagement of people in the design, because when, when you design something, there are always going to be problems in different contexts. So when you engage people early in the design, then you reduce some of those problems. And of course, then also the, the understanding that in the implementation process itself is very, very complex. And that you need to then uh, look at the problems and adjust it as you go along and not evaluate th three years later because the problems are already there. So this is so-called a formative evaluation that you do. And it's many of the issues are about communications. It's about building the relationships, understanding the problems on the other side. So Asia has a perspective in terms of this is what we want, mm. uh, this is how we should do it, and you follow it. Right? So that's, I'm not suggesting that, but that's sort of the impression 
that the uh, private doctors have. Uh, so I, I guess it's, it's, uh, collaboration is something that, that can be built. So you need to really understand some of these issues. Can I speak out in defense of HA? <laughs> First of all, I think it's an overstatement to say that HA doctors are uncooperative. I think uh, the PPP section in HA has been cautious, is, is my impression. When they first started the program, they set up very strict governance rules, uh, checking performance, assessing uh, qualifications and all that, uh, therefore creating quite a bit of administrative burden for the scheme. Uh, but I wouldn't call that uncooperative, you see. In, in so far, the front lines are concerned. They are really only executing head office policy. And I can also assure you that in the past two years, we have been doing our best to try to simplify the administrative process with a view to do exactly what Dono and Professor envisage, that we should cooperate more with the private doctors. Um, a second issue is, is the question of how much we can afford to pay. Now, we have received a lot of representation that our rate is too low, that it's not attractive, that we should increase it, and so forth and so forth. But then, we do have public interest to consider. Mm. That may be another area of contention when private doctors consider HA to be uncooperative. I think yeah. that, that is actually what happened. But moving forward, we do intend to do more PPP, but again, we are faced with some constraints. The top one of which is, would more PPPs result in more of our doctors leaving HA to go into private practice? Now this is a vicious circle, you see. So unless we can resolve this issue once and for all, we are hesitant at this point of time to expand PPP by a very large scale. That is the point we are trying to do. Now, it is possible that if we do PPP in another format, that risk may be minimized. And what we are considering now is, for instance, corroborate more with GBA hospitals corroborate more with Hong Kong Samchan Hospital, Hong Kong U Samchan Hospital. Ask them to take over some of our cases or ask them to do some imaging for us because if we do that, the risk of our doctors leaving HA is minimized. This is one area we are looking into, you see, but we need to resolve our manpower retention issue before we are comfortable with moving strides ahead on PPP projects. Mm.先生,我都想回應一個有關於那個剛才講溝通的問題。我想除了是HA和CR之間的溝通,PPP之外,其實HA和病人的服務使用者的溝通都重要。其實一出一些新的PPP program,都總會有些老友記,即係揸
誒即係有個邀請，而呢個邀請希望咧能夠即係講解得清楚啲，都明白其實係做啲咩之外咧，另外就係未入條隊嘅，可能都要有啲策略，即係誒用啲方法，即係 PPP 咁樣誒轉移喺私家嗰度去接受個服務咯。Professor Yeo, your response first. One, uh, do you support mandatory medical insurance like what、uh, Henry just、uh, discussed? And 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 second, I, I think.、Um, Uh, so Henry repeatedly、uh, sort of talks about the the concern for stress, giving additional stress to hospital authority for the PPP program,、uh, which, even though we are not just talking about primary care, but it's one of the emphasis of the report is primary care.、Um, you still have a big concern for the. No, so, no, so. I'm of、uh, less concern when talking about primary care.、Right. I was referring to PPP in general. Hospital care. Because、okay. there was some.、Uh, Allegation that our doctors have not been cooperative. I was speaking out in defence、oh, okay. of that. So, so <laughs>、okay. uh, but that aside,、yeah. in terms of primary care, I mean, hospital authority would welcome if a decision is taken to take primary care basically off HA and let us concentrate on secondary and tertiary. I mean, that that's our mission. After all, we are、mm. hospital authority managing hospitals. We are not supposed to be doing GOPC. But for historical reasons, it was given to hospital authority, and we have、uh, continued. That's with even、it. a bigger discussion now. You <laughs> see, so, so Professor Yeo, you have <laughs> you have a view on、uh, sort of taking primary care yeah, from it, hospital authority. Let's talk、so. about、uh, medical insurance. I think certainly when you look at、um, providing、uh, universal access, so really an equitable system where people don't suffer financial hardship because of having to pay for healthcare. I think that's all. All of us think that's a good thing. There are only two systems that can do it. One is by social health insurance. The second is tax-based systems. So it's a question of in tax-based systems whether you spend enough or not in your in your tax-based systems. Although we we say we put a lot in, but when you look at the amount of money, it's、uh, in total health expenditure in Hong Kong. Half is public, half is private, and the other half in the private is mainly out of pocket and it's very inefficient. So really, one needs to look at the system's efficiency and what are the mechanisms. So, if you do not want to change your system, so you can change your med med social insurance. But there have been so many attempts since、uh, the Harvard report in 1999.、Uh, so every time you go, people don't want to pay. So really, it's not so easy to change the financing system. Some countries have done it, but there are contexts in terms of when you can do it. So we haven't reached a stage where, in my view, if you suddenly ask people to contribute, they are not going to. It's no go. Uh, unless there's a crisis, right? Unless something's happening, unless you take opportunities,、uh, so so if you do not do that, then you need to look at your tax-based system. How can you use your resources better? And you need to look at the public and private as one system. So the the segmentation is a problem. So if you have two segments, how do the two segments work? People just go between the two systems, and that's the inefficiency. So how can you use our system? Look at the total resources in our system. Not even the out-of-pocket is also part of the solution. So that would be the the insurance that government has done to try to get private insurance to be more full risk. But there's things things you can't touch in the private sector because people can go. But the biggest problem that we have is primary care. So hospital care, the, the proportion in private sector is very small. So people are rich; they can pay for it. And better pay、uh, transparency, like、uh, what our CU Medical Centre is doing, where people know what they're going to pay, it's affordable. Many people are willing to go. So I think we need to have a, a different mechanisms. If we don't want to then change the financing system, which I don't think is going to be possible anyway, then we need to look at the different levers. So it's not just one simple thing that you look, look at. And uh, uh, in, in the hospital authority, the biggest problem is the community care. The social care, the support to patients, the readmissions, 20 percent readmissions within 30 days. Just looks at the failure of the of the postage charge support. So if you were able to deal with that, the hospital authority would reduce the demand. If you have better primary care, better people that can take the load off the system, that would also be a great boom to the system. So you have the two ends. So if you separate it. It's going to be more difficult to coordinate. In fact, I was the one that put the primary care into the hospital authority. <laughs> right? Yes. And when Margaret Chen was director of health, she wanted to have extension, and I negotiated with her to say, Department of Health should not provide services. They should only be 
regulators and the policy support to the Bureau and for public health functions. Because that's the, what's needed by the Bureau. Because in no country in the world, it's the Ministry of Health does not have that technical arm. So every ministry, even in the UK, the Chief Medical Officer is part of the ministry. But they, they don't have anyone there uh, in the ministry. So you have a problem. So, so you, there's so many of these inter intertwined problems that need to be addressed. Uh, but the, the movement should be really providing better primary care and then better aftercare. Just curious, that, at that point, why don't you change the ordinance of hospital authority? The, to, the ordinance does to... not need to be changed. We looked at the hospital authority ordinance. It doesn't define what hospital services are. <laughs> So that's why we, we moved the... Well, I'm saying, like, why don't you change the name to health authority at that point? It should point? be. <laughs> right? It should be a health authority. So, so the, uh, the government is thinking about separate primary health authority. I suggested, why don't you have a health authority? And the AHA can be the, pur the purchaser. The seven clusters can be providers. Uh, I'm sure Donald agrees with that. So the purchase provider split. So, so the, the, hospital, the hospital can be the health authority and then be the purchaser on behalf of government, and the seven clusters can compete for the population. Or, or even in, in some countries, you can even contract out one cluster to a private sector. There are models in the world where you have pr private providers providing care for a, 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 popula a population, uh, uh, catchment population. And in fact, uh, uh, I, I did tell, tell the chairman that in, in uh, going month, in fact, did ask me to do a, a population-based funding model for the hospital authority in terms of doing a capitation model for the seven clusters based on needs. So it could be uh, used as a system. Even now, you could use it in terms of resource allocation to the seven clusters. And that would improve efficiency. It could improve competition because you can have an effective population. People can go to whichever cluster they think it provides the best care. Harry. Before you uh, speak on behalf of, as an XH chairman, I'm just going to ask you, intellectually, don't you think what Professor Yeo said seems appealing? Just, just not as, as a chairman of XH first. Uh, <laughs> both as a chairman and as a non-chairman, <laughs> it's appealing. But what I'm saying is, um, we cannot continue expansion at hospital authority without some limitation. I mean, we're already spending 80 billion a year and more. And if you keep on changing, giving us more and more work, we, we have manpower problem at the moment. We have lots of other issues. In my view, it's good if you split up primary care and secondary and tertiary care, split it up. And I think government is doing a primary care blueprint. I hope the blueprint would go in that direction. I'm certainly not uh, envisaging changing our name from hospital authority to health authority and then giving us more work because we can't cope with it. <laughs> if I can ask uh, each of our panelists to wrap it up, uh, maybe 30 seconds or one minute of final thoughts to really help us to synthesize our, our thoughts. Well, as I started, the four issues the provider, the end user, the finance, and then also the stewardship. I think we touched all upon that. The second point, which I did talk about, is the standards, the trust. I think a lot has improved there. And then by training our family doctors. As a, before, it was untrained doctors that were GPs. Mm -hmm. And now we have the specialty of family medicine. We have international accreditation as such. But overall, just to sum up, I think this is excellent. The strategy, the strategic purchasing is the way ahead. It addresses a lot of the problems that we have highlighted. It will provide actually incentive for private practitioners. So the scope of service will be widened and also looks at the needs and also prevention um, for the needy uh, population. But the point I want to make is stewardship. I think your know, primary health care authority is really much needed at this point in time. Thank you. Tim, uh, the other side. <laughs> 我想剛才我們主要討論都是從一個 medical 或者 health 的角度去講 
做到一個 health 咧，咁所以即係個題目除咗 health for all 之外咧，我一調翻轉 ，all for health 都係值得要諗嘅，就係、是、除咗誒 medical side。Social side 又點樣 support 咧？點樣同個 community 去 engage 咧？咁大家一齊去做好呢件事，先至做到一個 health for all， 亦都係 all for health。Thank you, Tim. Henry, your points loud and clear, but well, <laughs> yes, well, as I said, I agree with the report. I think it's a great report. I agree with all the four recommendations, and it is now up to government to work out a roadmap and, if possible, a timeline, and the hospital authority. Is ready, willing, and able to fully corroborate with the government to do so. Thank, Thank you, Henry. You. Professor Yeo, your final words. Yeah, I, I think I just want to say two short things. One is, of course, the problem is that Henry is saying, uh, if you do more of the same, it's not going to solve the problem. So, so you need really to have a different paradigm, a different perspective, uh, even within the HA. Uh, I, I would suggest. And the second, with, and of course, in the system, is more important. How the system, the governance. So it really depends on the. Leadership of the government to look at the roles of the private sector, the the, the strategic purchasing. What are the anchors of that? But one of the key things that we need to much more study in terms of because we we put very broad things in, but where are your priorities going to be? Which are the problems you want to address first? Because you cannot do everything at the same time. So you need to have a much greater study uh, in, in, for policy and then looking at the issues and then prioritize. So I think that's necessary. So what we've done is just put the concepts there, but much more work needs to be done, and that's why we always said that government should be funding policy research, which is not yeah. currently being done. Right. And the second would be what Tim was saying. What we have not covered are the social, social in terms of health. So our our, our vice chancellor set up an institute for health equity, and that looks at so-called the the uh, social causes of health. Mm. There are many causes of health. That emanate from、uh, social factors, so those are the upfront things, and the district health system should be doing that, addressing the the social causation of health, the social factors, the reaching out, looking at social determinants, and addressing them, and that's the upfront part which we've not covered. Thank you, Professor. With that,、uh, thanks so much for all the panelists. Thank you.